the banking system now is facing a uh, huge overload of debt, both public and private, and how are they going to deal with that? Uh, if they let the uh, system collapse into depression, you have a fantastically unstable political consequence. We discovered that in the 1930s. All sorts of dangerous political movements uh, can gen be generated out of a depressionary scenario. So the most likely thing that they would do was to try to keep inflating the bubble. And that leads eventually to a hyperinflationary event. So although one can't predict it with apodictic certainty, I think you'd be very imprudent not to believe that that's a likely possibility. Well, the Weimar Republic was in the 20s. Uh, the Great Depression uh, in the United States was in the 30s. The Weimar Republic hyperinflation occurred in 1923. It took about six months from June, July of 23 to the end of November, first week in December, to destroy the currency entirely. Of course, they'd had a lot of inflation in Germany during World War I and the early years of the Weimar Republic. Uh, they had a lot of problems that are similar to ours today. A huge overload of debt on the German economy because of the reparations payments under the Versailles Treaty. Our problem in the 30s was the opposite of that one. It was the banking collapse, the fractional reserve banking system collapsed, went into depression, and then of course the Roosevelt administration began taking some, at that time, rather radical steps to try and correct that problem. Never did until, of course, World War II came on. But we've seen the two sides of that. And the worst of all possible worlds, of course, is to have the hyperinflationary event, the blowout of the currency, the Weimar style, and then following on immediately from that, the depression, the complete collapse of the economy. So we're looking at a situation now which I think is really unprecedented in modern times that we could go through both of those steps, one right after the other, and then be left with an economy without a functioning monetary system. Well, the plan is basically an attempt to create an alternative competitive currency so that you would have Federal Reserve currency continuing to circulate to the extent that it will. But on the other hand, people can use an alternative now, the difficulty is how you introduce that alternative. Uh, from my perspective, it's essentially impossible to believe that Congress would be a vehicle for doing this. Uh, they're pretty much dysfunctional as it is politically, and I think in recent years we've discovered that they're more or less controlled from the lobbying perspective by the high finance and banking uh, groups. Uh, on the other hand, the average person could certainly use an alternative currency because in the United States, Federal Reserve notes are not required to be used as money. If you choose to do, then they become legal tender for that contract in which you've entered. But you could choose to use gold, you could choose to use silver, you could use, use, uh, choose to use foreign currencies such as euros, yuan, whatever. Most people don't, however, because there's a lack of knowledge of the existence of that alternative. Secondly, there's a lack of experience with doing it. Unless you happen to live on the Canadian border or the Mexican borders, most Americans have no experience with using alternative currencies. The third alternative is the middle level, which is the state government. The state governments are in an interesting position legally because they can do this. They're a relatively large economic player in the market in terms of the amount of uh, purchasing power they take in and the amount that they spend. Uh, they still have a certain amount of political credibility with the people. They're highly visible, so what they do is not going to be lost on the people in that jurisdiction. And the people still politically in many states can control the composition of their state legislatures. So the idea is to have a state adopt an alternative currency. And my proposal is to ad adopt what's called electronic gold or electronic silver currency, which is basically gold and silver bullion kept in a depository, each individual owns some part of that stored gold and silver, and then title to that is transferred electronically, uh, wire transfers, debit cards, whatever. We have all these modern mechanisms for doing it. So the state would adopt this alternative currency, set up a state depository, provide its citizens with the debit cards and other devices that would be used, and then to prime the pump we take some very small percentage of the state revenues. So in, uh, where this has been proposed in New Hampshire and Montana, they were looking at the tobacco tax. Tobacco tax is 7, 10, 12% of the total revenue. So you can't say that 
turning that into a gold or silver account is imprudent financially. Uh, in fact, I think most treasurers of the states would say, oh, yeah, 10 percent in gold, perfectly, perfectly fine. Uh, secondly, this is totally liquid. So they get the gold in and they can transfer it if they needed to in Federal Reserve notes. But the idea is 7 to 10 percent of the revenue of the state would come in yearly in gold and silver in one of these systems. And then the state would make available to its own creditors the option of taking their receipts in the alternative currency. And my anticipation is that the creditors would very quickly line up, first come, first served, to take these receipts. The treasurer would then come back to the state legislature and say, oh, our gold fund is being depleted within two months of receipt. We want to expand our tax base. And I think not so slowly, but surely at least, you would find that particular state moving further and further in the direction of the alternative currency and away from Federal Reserve notes. Now, this is on the hypothesis, of course, that Federal Reserve notes continue to depreciate in purchasing power. If, by some miracle, Mr. Bernanke or his successor solves the problems of the Federal Reserve and the banking system and what's going on in Wall Street, and that returns to a sound basis, then the alternative currency, I take it, would sort of sit there like an insurance policy, probably wouldn't be used by many people. But the beauty of an insurance policy is when you need it, you need it, right? And right now it's pretty obvious that we need it. And that's my selling point here is that this is not a very costly program to set up. In fact, the states don't even have to set up the depositories and the transfer mechanisms. They can hire a private or, or, or uh, license the technology from some of these private firms that have already proven this system in the marketplace. Not very expensive. No one necessarily has to use it, so you're not going to derange the economy overnight by saying, oh, we're shifting immediately away from Federal Reserve notes. And the economy then can equilibrate and develop a gold and silver price mechanism at its own rate, depending on what the economy determines the imprudence of continuing to use Federal Reserve notes may be. So it seems to me the perfect answer to this problem, because it puts us in a position with dealing with the worst case scenario, but not on the other hand, committing ourselves 100% to some system which I guess you could say politically has never really been tested. Well, I think it was Samuel Johnson who said, nothing concentrates a man's mind more than his impending hanging. If you're looking at economic crisis, economic chaos, perhaps, the prudent man says, well, I need to do something to deal with this. We have 50 states. I'm not assuming that they will all get on board this program at once. But if one or two are capable of doing that, the economic consequences then, with the full power of the market behind it, I think will drive other states in the same direction. So in a sense, we're running a kind of experiment here at the state level. Why do I think it can happen politically? Because some states still are controlled by their electorate. They may be small states, Montana, New Hampshire, maybe Virginia, some of these states, not California, probably not Massachusetts, not New York. But once a state adopts this program, on the assumption again that the Federal Reserve note is going to continue to depreciate, we're going to have a continued crisis in the banking system, the full force of the marketplace will behind, be behind the adoption of this currency. And in any competi competition between the market and the Federal Reserve, I think it's a surety which one will prevail. So if you imagine uh, Virginia doing this, I would imagine it wouldn't take very long before Maryland, West Virginia, the states that have commercial transactions would begin looking very seriously at it. But then on the other side, it's just the pressure of the marketplace, other people on the other side of the country, in Arizona, we'll look at what's happening in Virginia and say, why don't we have this kind of security? I don't think that you really need to be a Harvard-trained economist to understand the difference between a collapsing currency and a currency that's maintaining its purchasing power. I think the average man can figure that out. His difficulty is that he doesn't have a mechanism that allows him to take advantage of that insight. And that's what I'm trying to get these state legislators to set up this mechanism, and then I anticipate, once the average man is given that choice, common sense will dictate the course of action. In point of fact, Federal Reserve notes do not have to be accepted if you've made your contract payable in some other medium of exchange. And in fact, the Federal Title 31 of the United States Code, which you just mentioned, has a provision 
Section 5118D2, which specifies that. So the average person today can make contracts in gold and silver. He just doesn't have a viable practical mechanism for enforcing those. He doesn't have gold and silver banks. He doesn't have gold and silver credit cards, gold and silver debit cards, and so forth and so on. So the average person is not really in a practical position to do it. Now, if you look at the states from the point of view of their legal position, this was decided by the Supreme Court just after the Civil War. We have a similar situation today as the one they had then. They had circulating United States legal tender paper notes, United States notes, which were irredeemable in gold or silver. In fact, they remained irredeemable until 1877. And simultaneously, there was circulation of the gold and silver coinage of the country. So the state of Oregon had a state statute that required that its taxes be collected in gold and silver coin of the United States. A sheriff collected taxes in paper currency. And they called him on that because of his bond. He was supposed to produce gold and silver. He said, well, wait a minute. Congress has passed this statute saying that legal tender United States notes can be used for all debts, public and private. Went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, wrong. The states have given up some of their sovereign authority in the Constitution, but they've retained quite a bit of their authority. They are still governmental entities. And if a state chooses to tax in gold or silver coin, gold or silver bullion, or in kind, in things, it has the power to do that. And there was another case that came on and reaffirmed that a few years later. So if you look at the powers of the states, well, there's taxation, borrowing, public spending, uh, paying judgments in eminent domain where they take property from someone and then pay the fair market value of that property. All of the uh, fees and judgments and fines and so forth that go through the court systems. All of those are within the sovereign prerogatives of the state. So if the state chooses to use some alternative currency for those purposes, the Supreme Court has already said that's protected by the Constitution. We don't even need a statute, but in fact there is a statute that allows that to happen. And the states, of course, have the constitutional power. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 says, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Now, this particular proposal that I'm putting forward does not force the alternative currency on anyone. So it's not really a legal tender provision in that sense, except for taxation. Some people have to pay their taxes. But taxes are not debts, constitutionally speaking. Right? So the state can certainly tax 100% in gold if it wanted to, and then it can certainly make available to its creditors gold and silver if the creditors choose to take that. If they're foolish enough to continue to take Federal Reserve notes, the state simply liquefies some of its gold fund into Federal Reserve notes and pays the creditor. So we really have no legal problem. And that's why I'm proposing this at the state level, because we have no legal problem at the state level, because the state retains these governmental powers. If an average citizen were to do this in large numbers, well, we don't know what the Treasury of the United States might try to do in federal court. Maybe they come in and say the average citizen can't do this. Maybe Congress might repeal that uh, provision of Title 31 that allows average citizens to make gold clause contracts. It did that in 1933. It might do that again. But it couldn't do it with respect to a state. And that's the key element here. Because once you have the state in the system, there's an intergovernmental immunity, as lawyers would call it. There are certain things that the government in Washington cannot do to the states in the same way there are certain things that the states cannot do to the government in Washington. Let's put it this way, politically anything's possible in Washington, D.C., right, when they get desperate. But if you look at it from the constitutional legal perspective, no, I don't think so, because number one, this gold would be being used by the state as one of its governmental functions. So Congress cannot, or the President through Congress, cannot come in and tell the states how they're going to perform their internal governmental functions. Number two, that gold seizure, interestingly enough, was never sustained by the court, by the Supreme Court of the United States. There was never a decision by the Supreme Court of the United States that said the gold seizure was valid even with respect to individuals, private individuals, let alone state governments. And thirdly, as a practical matter, if you look back at the the history of the gold seizure, probably less than 50% of the gold that the Treasury believed was out in the marketplace, gold coin, was actually turned in. And in the 1930s, I think people were probably much more likely to 
uh, give the government credibility and be willing to trust the statements of the president and the treasury than they are today. So if only 50% came in in the 30s, how much would be turned in today? I would say it would probably be close to zero. No one would comply with that. And how could it be enforced? That's the interesting factor. In that time, most of the gold was held where? was in the banks, because the banks were dealing with a gold redeemable currency. So the banks simply took that gold and turned it over to the treasury. And then of course there were some people who had gold in a shoebox or whatever and they brought it in. But most of the gold that was out in private possession wasn't turned in. Well today most gold is in private possession. I mean the central banks hold some, but in terms of the marketplace, people don't deposit their gold in banks. Our banking system, Federal Reserve system, doesn't have gold accounts, doesn't have silver accounts. So where is all, all that gold now? Well, it's in safety deposit boxes, shoe boxes, wherever it is. What's the likelihood that people are simply going to turn around in the midst of an economic crisis because that would be the trigger? Yes. And especially when their own state is telling them, we're going to use gold for our transactions within our state economy, what's the likelihood they're going to comply with some order from the treasury? Because once it comes into the treasury of the state, then it circulates through the electronic system and now it's under the state immunity. So let's assume I have some gold in a shoebox and I, th this treasury order comes out of Washington saying, oh, 30 days from now you have to turn all that in to one of the Federal Reserve Banks. I go down to the State Depository and put it in the State Depository. And now what happens if the treasury comes to the State Depository? The State Depository is Lane County versus Oregon. Get away from here. This is our gold. It's state, state gold. You can't touch this. Get away from here. When you come to the 30s, everyone simply acquiesced in what went on during the Roosevelt administration. There was never even a test of this gold seizure, which I always found amazing because here were all these people turning in gold and there were some people whose gold was confiscated from them. The Supreme Court never wanted to touch it. Well, I think we're going to see it again when the Montana legislature comes back into session. The problem there is they meet only every two years of this hiatus because they have gone through two steps already. First time the bill was introduced, it died in committee, nine to nine. Second time the bill was introduced, comes out of committee, goes to the House floor, it lost, I don't know, 47 to 52, it's about five or six vote difference, very close. Are economic conditions getting better? Are the banks more sound today than they were a year or two years ago? No. The next time that bill comes up in Montana, I have a feeling it's going to pass, very good chance of that bill passing in Montana. Uh, in Virginia, we're trying to promote a uh, study commission to lay all this on the table primarily to educate the state legislators. That is the major problem in every state is that the state legislatures have never looked at this kind of an issue before. And so their natural inclination is to say, oh no, that's not a state problem, that's a problem for the Federal Reserve, that's a problem for Congress. Once we get over that hurdle, their next inclination is to say, well, uh, uh, you know, who else is doing this? Do we want to go out on that political limb? Do we want to be the first state to do this and possibly have the media coming down on us or whatever be, being criticized? Uh, that is really a difficult one to get over because there's this natural inclination, kind of an ostrich mentality, I would call it, in the state legislators just to hide from this issue. They don't want to be up front. They don't want to be on the firing line. But the point is, one or another, we have 50 states, one or another one is going to do it. In Montana, I think they're very advanced. In, in Utah as well, they're coming at it from a different perspective. They're looking at setting up an alternative system based on United States gold and silver coinage. Uh, I'm not enamored of that because the, the amount of that coinage is controlled by whom? The U.S. Treasury. All right, really. They talk about minting coins to meet public demand, but that's not the same as what used to be called free coinage, where all the gold and silver that comes to the mint, they will in fact mint. So there's a kind of neck of the funnel problem with the Utah approach because the state itself cannot coin money. All right? No state shall coin money, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. So if you're looking at a system where you want to monetize as much gold and silver, get as much of that gold and silver into the system as possible, here we have a limitation and it's a bad limitation because at the federal level, they're probably mostly against the reuse, remonetization, really, of gold and silver. The alternative currency system has the beauty of it operating on the basis of bullion. There's no coinage involved in the system at all. So the state doesn't run in, into that neck of the funnel problem. And bullion can come in from everywhere in the world. There's no limit. 
essentially you monetize the entire gold and silver stock of the world through the use of the electronic currency system. That's exactly what the Constitution provided for originally. Congress had the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof and a foreign coin, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. Why is that a foreign coin language in there? Because the idea was to have all of the foreign coins of the world, gold and silver, that were trustworthy would become part of the American monetary system. They were going to monetize the entire gold and silver stock of the world. Didn't work for political reasons, because today, for instance, gold and silver coin foreign manufacture are not legal tender. They're not recognized as money in this country by statute. But that was the principle. We can now do that at the state level through the electronic system. And the beauty of the electronic system is it's already been proven. This is not my idea or your idea or something that was just drafted yesterday. There are a number of these companies out there in the private sector who have worked on this and shown that it's perfectly feasible. Uh, the one I tend to uh, recommend to people to look at at least is goldmoney.com, started by a gentleman by the name of James Turk, mm -hmm. man of ter terrific integrity, great knowledge in this area. And he has demonstrated that this is a workable system. Gold, silver, I think he has platinum in the system now. Uh, he works down to, what, a hundredth of a, gra hundredth of a gram of gold, hundredth of a gram. Well, now you're talking about making small change in gold. And this was the great problem of the coinage system, and certainly is today, that there were only certain sizes of coins. And then how did you deal with those prices that fell in between the different coins? So then you had to have token coinage, then you talk about paper money, you bring in all of these uh, what I would call dangerous additions to the system because now other things that really aren't money are being treated as if they were money. All right? With the electronic system, you could go down to a thousandth of a gram, a ten thousandth of a gram, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. The computers will handle that, which means that you never have to use these monetary artifacts. You constantly remain within the gold and silver structure. And the third beauty of the system is that gold that's in the state depository is not the state's gold. This isn't a banking system where I take my money to the bank, it goes across the teller's counter, it becomes the bank's money, and the bank then owes me some kind of a debt which may or may not be paid. Ask MF uh, Global, right? People connected with MF Global. In this kind of a system, the alternative currency system, that gold in the depository is owned by each depositor. It's what's called a bailment system. So now we have the interests of the people directly connected with their money because it's their direct personal property. And that's the best of all possible worlds. If the people can't have absolute control over their gold, and of course you can get it out of the depository. If you want to keep it in, in a safety deposit box, if you want to keep it in the shoe box, that's fine too. But if you don't have personal possession, personal ownership, what we have discovered over centuries really is that system then tends to be driven to control by an elite financial group at the top, and as we've seen now, driven over the edge. So it's a, it's a two-level problem. The difficulty is, well, resources. In a, to enable you to reach the constituency. And that's why I've tried to come at this from the level of having uh, the state legislature set up some sort of study commission. Because then it's all focused. An official body of the state legislature, you bring in the witnesses, you bring in the evidence, you have the testimony, some kind of an official report comes out, and one would hope that people are looking at this, the constituents are looking at what's going on in the legislature, and then that their own legislators will be reporting this back. So you get a feedback mechanism that will be, yes. tend to educate those folks in the grassroots. Now, of course, the step two is to go to people in the grassroots who are already organized on some other issues and point out, wait a minute, you're not going to accomplish what you want to accomplish over there unless we have this monetary problem solved. If we don't have a sound basis for running our economy, and that depends upon a sound monetary unit, the things you want to do in these other areas, you won't be able to accomplish. You're not going to be successful in a hyperinflationary environment. You're not going to be successful in a depressionary environment. We have to get this controlled first. The picture that comes to my mind is body is wheeled in on a gurney to the emergency room, been in a terrible automobile accident. Femoral artery is cut. Poor fellow's going into you know, heart palpitations and seizures. What do they do first? They stop the bleeding. Right? Because if he bleeds to death, they don't have to worry about the heart. And that's our problem. We have a number of heart conditions, liver ailments, kidney failure, and so forth and so on in our economy. But we have this femoral artery problem in our monetary system. If we don't control that, you can forget about the rest of it. 
we'll go into some kind of crisis mode and these other things will be, become trivial, really, compared to hyperinflation. And I'd like to point out hyperinflation is very, very important to keep in mind because of the political consequences. You look at Germany in 23, very sophisticated population, high level of culture, science, art, music, whatever it was, philosophy, right? Germany was not a third world country by any stretch of the imagination. It had gone through World War I, so it had a number of political, political and economic problems. But what happened? They went down the road, false economic doctrine, false monetary system, collapsed through hyperinflation. And I don't think you'll find an economic historian today or ever who looked back on that situation and said that was not one of the foundational elements that led to the radicalism in Germany that led eventually to Hitlerism. Could have been communism, turned out to be Nazism, but it was radical politics. You inject hyperinflation into an economy, it has not only economic consequences, but terrifically deleterious social and political consequences. And if we don't get the monetary unit corrected, the standard on which all of the price structure depends, what will the consequence be? And this particular monetary system that we have, or, or the free market will go, back, go up to the next level, the free market system, is dependent upon a very complex price structure. And as a result of that price structure, people have found all sorts of economic niches. And we're dependent upon those economic niches, niches continue to function. I mean, major urban areas, where do they get their food? A couple of thousand miles away, perhaps, has to be delivered. So you have transportation, you have the food production, you have the transportation, you have the marketing, you have the distribution. And all of these things depend upon this highly complicated price structure in order to allocate resources. Well, the price structure depends upon what? Some kind of a unit, right? We call it the dollar, the pound, the shilling, the euro, whatever it may be. There's this unit. If that unit fails, the entire price structure comes down. And then how do you replace it? Well, if there's no alternative, you're left with a long period of time, potentially, in which you're dealing with chaos. And the more complicated the structure is, the greater that chaos will be. So I'm looking at this from the point of view of, yes, we're going to have some chaos down the road. There's no way out of that. We're on that treadmill. We can't get off. But we need to put in this alternative, and we need to put in it soon, because the sooner we put it in, the sooner the market can develop a price structure based in the alternative currency. And then if the Federal Reserve note really does collapse, sayonara. We really didn't need it. Yes, the Titanic sank, but we had enough lifeboats. See, this is our problem. That what happened to the Titanic? The Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats, and they couldn't build any more. We're in a situation where, at the present time, we don't have enough lifeboats, but we can build them state by state. If we don't do that, I would think that would be the most imprudent action that has probably been taken in modern Western civilization. I think historians will look back at this and say, what fools they were. They had, they had this problem staring them in the face, no one had a solution for it at the level of the Federal Reserve, at the level of the U.S. Treasury, at the level of the Euro, whatever, at the level of these banking systems. And some people were over there telling them, oh, we need to build a lifeboat, and they refused to do it. I mean, I've been driving a car since when, 1959. I've never hit the little blind girl in the wheelchair in the crosswalk. That doesn't mean I don't keep $300,000, $500,000 worth of liability insurance because the day may come when I will hit the little blind girl in the wheelchair, and I have to be prepared for that. I think that the collapse of our present monetary system is far more likely than my ever hitting the little blind girl in the wheelchair. But I have insurance, but we don't. And the alternative currency system is really simply insurance at the one level at which we can put it in, effectively and quickly. We have two levels. First, there's the, the level of the state's interaction with people. So it's no problem for the state to set uh, tax rates and fee rates and payment that it's going to make to various credit. And a lot of people are creditors of the state. They may be small creditors of the state, but they're still creditors of the state. So in, in those interactions, the state will be saying, these taxes will be paid at such and such a rate. We'll pay our creditors at such and such a rate. And I would see that once this system was set up, the state would simply tell people, we have this depository, and we're going to make available to you the documentation you need to get into it. It's all done on the internet in any event. And once you signed up for it, we'll send you your debit card. So now you're capable of using our depository. Mm -hmm. You're capable of using our depository in dealings with us, the state. Yeah. And you're capable of using our depository in dealings with anyone else with which you would make an individual private contract, if they're both part of this system. 
Now the question then becomes, well, what about the price structure in the regular economy? And my approach to this would be to say for the states to go to the state businessmen, and most of these people are licensed in one way or another, their partnerships, their corporations, their LLCs, what have you, say within 30 to 60, 90 days of the passage of this statute, we want you to set up alternative prices in our alternative currency. And we'll give you the software, so your barcodes or whatever, we'll supply this to make it easy for you. But we want your customers to be able to come into your shop and see an alternative price in our new currency. We're not going to require initially that you tell the customer he has to pay in that. You can if you want to. That's up to you and the customer. The state's not going to force you to do it. And what I would anticipate at the gold side of this, people that are selling Mercedes would start having a gold price and probably a discount for buying that Mercedes in gold. At the supermarket level, you'd probably see silver prices. But the point is that those businessmen would be able to set up that alternative price structure and then we would see what competition did. Because now I'm able to walk into the grocery store, oh, I get to the cash register and I can, it tells me electronically, that a reserve note price, silver alternative currency price. I have my silver debit card. I say, oh, I'm going to get a 3% discount for paying with silver. I swipe that, right? and it's done. 60 to 90 days of the passage of the statute, this thing would be up and running. And this is a, a, what I would call a homeland security regulation. If this isn't done, we're going to have all sorts of chaos. So this is much more important than most of the things that they're required to do in terms of uh, corporate control, corporate reporting, corporate tax payments, whatever it is. I would actually go one step further with this, to be blunt with you. Every state under the Constitution is required to have a militia structure. They call the Constitution called the militia of the several states. And actually, there's no state in the Union that really has it as it ought to be. And that would be everyone from 16 on up is required to do something in this structure, not necessarily have a gun or paramilitary activity and a lot of other things they could do. But that's the ultimate coercive element under the state's police, what they call the state's police powers, is that people have this social responsibility. And that's the way I'd structure it in the statute. I'd say, oh, and part of your militia duty under code section such and such is that everyone in the state has to get one of these debit cards. You don't have to use it, but you have to get it. You have to be capable of using it. And all you businessmen have to come up with these numbers. You don't have to make your transactions in the alternative currency, but you have to be capable of doing it. In the same way that we could require you to have two weeks' worth of food and water in your homes. In the same way that we, requ we could require you, if you were able-bodied and not a conscientious objector, to have a firearm and to come out to training. And there's no question constitutionally that a state can require all of that. So this is really a simple level. We're saying <laughs> we have an economic problem potentially leading to a crisis. We want you to take these very simple steps for which we'll provide you with the infrastructure. Yeah. And then we're going to allow you to make these transactions just as, as you are allowed to do it now if you wanted to. And what we think will happen is the marketplace on the one side and the collapse of the Federal Reserve on the other side will cause it to be in your economic interest. Oh, and by the way, at the state level, if it's in our governmental interest to increase our tax base, we're going to do that. So we're, we're going to take the lead, I guess, in this at the state level because we have to preserve the state structure in order to maintain that total political structure. But the element of coercion in this will be the same element of coercion that the market applies to people. Here's the rotting cabbage and here's the good cabbage. Which one do you buy? Well, that's the basic theory of the police power, that the yeah. states have certain powers. The ultimate goal is not the state as a kind of the government people, right? The state is this institution. The institution is there for the purpose of exercising these powers in order to protect the public against yeah. real perceived dangers. And here's a danger that we're not being protected against from Washington, because actually Washington is the source of this danger. The state has the constitutional power to do it. The state has the duty to perform this function, and then the average citizen who could be called upon to perform many more duties for the state is being called upon to perform only one. Make yourself capable of functioning within this alternative system. Know where your lifeboat station is on the Titanic. You're in lifeboat station 22.